Hi. Welcome to another edition to Ask the Police Chief. I'm Steve Rosales, your host, and with me today, of course, is the Police Chief, James McIsaac. Chief. Steve. How are you doing, my friend? Very well, thank you. Hope your holidays were good. They were good. All Excellent. right. So today is, we're into 2023. What's today? Today is January 12th. Uh, thir 13th, Friday. Friday <laughs> so I hope that's not an omen. <laughs> it's Friday the 13th, 2023. So, uh, well, we've had, for sleepy little Belmont, we experienced kind of a, uh, something that hasn't happened in quite a time recently, January 9th. Yes, we did. We had, um, and, and I'll, I'll preface my comments by saying I can't get into too much detail. I, I'd rather talk about maybe the response that the officers did on that night, on January 9th at, um, I think it was about 5.20 p.m., we uh, responded to a shots fired call on Olmstead Drive. And the officers, uh, we had four officers working the street that night, one street supervisor and three patrol officers. And they were on scene within a minute and a half of getting the, um, the we got, received two 911 calls. They were on scene within a minute and a half. And um, they were determining, you know, we've gone to shots fired, call, shots fired calls before, and it's usually fireworks, or we don't have any evidence that there were shots fired other than the noise. Um, but the officers were able to, uh, to observe evidence right away that there had been some, uh, a firearm had been discharged. And um, so they began to preserve the scene. And then through a subsequent preliminary investigation, we learned that there were two victims at uh, area hospitals with gunshot wounds. And, um, you know, it, it, it was more than a coincidence that they both arrived at the hospitals, um, you know, in the area following um, this around, report. Of around the, the same yeah. time. And um, the officers did uh, an outstanding job. And, you know, I'll talk about the response to that. So that when they get there and, and they're, they're, they're marking evidence, they're uh, determining, you know, kind of what happened. They're searching, doing a cursory search of the area. But once we learned that there were potential victims, um, then we call the state police crime scene unit uh, to come out. We notify the Middlesex district attorney. And all the wheels kind of start to turn. Um, the, and, you know, we, we work in a great place for, for policing and law enforcement in general, I, I believe. Um, Massachusetts is one of the best. And, you know, the, our area um, departments in Lexington, Arlington, Watertown, Waltham, um, they all uh, had offices on standby on the, on the border of Belmont, and not necessarily to help us with the shooting but to help us because they knew that, uh, they know that an incident like that is gonna tie up our entire shift. So those officers in the neighboring communities were standing by in case we had a routine call, it could be a medical call, it could be anything. Um, okay, that's what so we, refer, we refer to as mutual aid. Okay, so let's, let's sort of take this in a little bit of a piecemeal. So January 9th, 5.30 in the afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what day of the week that was, but uh, uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, reports of uh, shots fired. Uh, Olmstead Drive. That's the for people that may not know. That's you access that off of the end of Pleasant Street near Trapella Road, sort of opposite the back driveway entrance to the Star Market. That's right. And it goes up into that little uh, that uh, group of apartment uh, complex, little apartment complex that sort of sits above Trapella Road, right at the corner there. Yes. Right. That's yes. what I'm talking. Yeah. So I've got it right. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so the officers came, you have a few officers on the street, they arrived on the scene, determined that it was not fireworks and not, uh, you know, loud music or somebody banging a drum, um, but indeed, uh, actual shots fired. Was that, uh, without being able to, because I'm sure it's still under investigation, I'm sure things are being done. Mm -hmm. um, but casings on the ground, or I mean, what, what did they, they? There was, case, there was casings and there was other evidence as well. Um, that I don't want to get into, but one of the things um, that we had to do, uh, because you, now you know you have this incident and you, you, you figure there was two firearms up there, right? You want to make sure that uh, there isn't a firearm left in the bushes or, or in the woods so you somewhere. determined that there were two guns? We, we, were, we were able to determine that, yeah. And um, so what we did was, um, you know, right now, uh, that, 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 that incident was um, a test of our department because right now, we're budgeted for 48 sworn police officers. That's from me down to the, the last hired patrol officer is 48. We're actually operating at this time with 38. Um, I, I went back and looked over my career um, since 1999, 
In 2005 and in 2015, we operated with 42. Those were the last, those were the lowest in my career that we've ever operated with. But we're actually going with 38 now. So when we, ha you have an area like, you know, that area, there's some wooded area there and, um, you know, you want to search everything, right? We don't, we, we were uh, attempting to call in offices to come in um, to help with the search. And we had a number of offices that had already done 16 hours. And we ended up uh, getting uh, three offices came in. One of the offices that came in, just to give you an idea. Came in from off duty. Came Belmont from, offices came off duty. Came they, in they, from you know. off duty. And you know, to give you an idea about the workload, uh, the work time that these offices are working, we had, uh, it was Officer O'Donovan came in. He came in about 6 o'clock. Um, you know, he supplemented a shift with, with answering calls. He then worked midnight to 8. And then he had a, a, a court hearing in the morning. So he had to go to court till about 1 o'clock, I think it was, in the afternoon. So, you know, that's a lot of... That's a lot of work, and um, what we did, we thankfully we have a canine officer, Corey Taylor. He was able to call in a canine from Weston, from Waltham, from um, Watertown, and a state police canine. Uh, that they worked together, and they did a search, and they found a firearm um, about uh, probably a quarter mile from the uh, where the shooting took place. My goodness! And this took place not inside one of the units, no. obviously out out in outside, the open. Yes, parking yeah. lot or in the open. Yep. Okay. Public roaming around. I mean, it's five five thirty in the afternoon. Yeah, I assume it's. I don't know how many people live up there, but I assume five thirty in the afternoon, people are coming in, people are going out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. My goodness. Yeah. So, it's um you know, and we're not as a department. You know, we, I, I can't praise the offices enough. Uh, first of all, for 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 getting there within a minute and a half, and then the way they handled the initial scene, and the way they conducted the investigations and the search, and the way they're conducting the investigation right now is. Uh, it's really outstanding because we don't, you know, everybody knows, I'm not telling anybody, we don't deal with a lot of shootings. And um, to have a shooting like that take place and to have, it basically, it worked, uh, that night worked very well. I, I you know, I was going to have trouble going to sleep that night thinking that, you know, a kid, uh, in, in student in the morning waiting for the bus might pull a firearm out of bushes or something like that. When I got the the call at 10 30 it was about 10 30 at night that they had found <coughs> a firearm i was i was really relieved um that that they had found that that weapon okay one weapon two weapons um one we, weapon but one weapon we we we, 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 we okay. can account for the other one okay so they've been all been accounted for yeah. okay so um random act or, or two idiots of some sort it's, uh two two individuals that uh knew each other or does the public need to have more concern than they otherwise do. As we said, just in, from the, the as we said in the uh, the press release, we we it, there was no reason to believe this was a random act. Um, I think the the participants were, were known to each other. Um, but you know, it, it, as we say in in you know, Chief McLaughlin used to say it all the time too. We don't live in a bubble. We're not uh, immune from these types of things that that can you know that, that these bad things that can happen in other communities can happen here just as easily. And, um, you know, our office is aware of that. Um, you know, in terms of violence, yeah, we have, that was a shooting, but we, we go to plenty of uh, domestic violence calls where, you know, violence can be bad, you know. And um, so we're, we're, I don't want to say we're used to it, but it's, it's something that the police officers accept that, um, you know, it can happen. Do you a great deal, a great many domestic calls? Um, Domestics are not, a, I wouldn't say a great deal, many, and, and they've been pretty consistent over the years, but um, I think like any community, if you went to any community, they're going to have, uh, you know, maybe 70 a year, 75 a year. Um, you know, I think, over, you know, that's, that's been the majority of our, what our, we arrest for now um, in the last couple of years has been domestic violence. Yeah, well, you know, you're right. We don't live in a bubble. I mean, we like to think we are. I mean, mm -hmm. we seem to be removed. I mean, we've had a shooting. This is a shooting. Yeah. That that doesn't happen in Belmont. That's what people say. They don't happen here, you know. You, you get, but apparently it does. And I've said it on a lot of things that we're no different than any other town. Different yeah. different issues, but all towns are the people of the people. And it is what it is. But, uh, uh, okay, so, so the public can take a breath at least from these from this particular incident. 
It's yeah, been handled, was, and handled and is going through the criminal justice it, system, I'm assuming. Yeah, and as always, if there was, if we believe there was a danger or a threat to, to people in the, in the community, we would be more actively, you know, getting messages out and, and letting people know exactly what happened. But we don't feel that there's a, a threat to the, to the community as a whole. Okay, so you, you talked about it, you sort of hinted at it earlier, you spoke about the fact that there was, you needed outside help, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm appreciative to all the towns, I assume that it's, it's some type of a formal or an informal type of an arrangement for all the neighboring towns to cover each other, mutual response, maybe informal or formal, uh, I, I don't know, and I don't particularly care as long as somebody there, but you're at, we're at the lowest level of police, sworn officers, since since you came on in 1999 yeah, probably since ever because when I get when I was hired in 99 we, we were budgeted for 56 and I think we at that time we had 55 working well so I got to think before that you know you'd have to go way back to you know to well, when you were I was a selectman maybe. back in the ice age of the mid 90s just before you you were yeah. you were a young pup uh, and uh, but my memory was we had like 61 or 62 yeah, yeah. And we cut to 59 or something, and that was uh, a difficult situation. But down to 38. The uh, town covered? You need more help? That, well, so, you know, what else has changed over that time period? When I, when, I think it was around 2001 or 2002, when was well, the last the census around that time? The, the population of the town was around 24,000. We're up to 27 now. And it's going to get higher with the... Um, with the development up at McLean, the new residential. You have 27,000 people here 27, in town? 27,000. You in town, know, I, yeah. holy moly. So, you know, I, I think back probably when you were in high school, I think that's what the population was, probably around 27,000. Well, we had a large, yeah, yeah. We had, I had a large graduating class out of the high school in the, yeah. in the mid 70s. Yeah. 350, I think, were the size of the classes. Yeah. I think my daughter's graduated with 180 <laughs> or 200. I suppose that's a reflection of what it is, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know what it is at the moment, although there's less students in school if you if you Classes are they're big, well, they're bigger than when I was in high school in the mid-80s, so. But, uh, so, but, but come back, do you, do town need to give you more help? I would, um, well, we need to be able to hire our offices. Um, that's one of the things that we need to do. And, um, you know, we, we, I can't talk about contractual things well, that are going on. Well, I appreciate that, yeah. But, don't, um, don't, don't. Deal with any of that stuff. You know, stuff. we're getting help. I, I, I think that in, in order for us to, um, you know, when I, when I look back at, at the number of uh, offices that were budgeted for and the number of offices we have actually working, I think probably one time for about eight months over the last 20 years, we've actually been fully staffed. So, you know, I would look at it as I would like to bump the top number up and, and basically just keep hiring. Uh, because, you know, you have people, you know, right, retire early or they leave, they transfer. Um, people get injured and, and can no longer work. So you, very rarely I, have we ever been, we've never, I can say with confidence, we've never been fully staffed for more than a year. Well, since I've got you and, you know, you're the chief and I assume want to advocate for your department as a citizen and a taxpayer. I don't know, I live in this town for, I don't know, since first grade. So that that's a long time. Uh, but... So there's 38 uniformed sworn police officers, but out of that 38, some are command staff, yeah. some are detectives, some are assigned something else, there's a school resource officer. You have, what, three shifts? Yes. So you divide up yeah. sort of the rest. You have some that are sick or injured. You have mm -hmm. some that are on the uh, military service, I think. Some on vacation we do that's well-deserved. We do let them take let them vacation. Have vacation. Yeah. No, I get it, but I guess the point is is that that at times, there are probably, and I don't want this an advertisement uh, to, to the, to the uh, criminal element out there, but at times, there doesn't seem to be a lot of people out, out and about. Well, so we're going to make some, some moves in the next couple of weeks because we have, patrol is, is the, the backbone of the department. Sure. So, um, you know, we, we've had a, a vacant detective position for three years right now, you know, um, so that means more work for the, the people that are working in detective. We're going to make some moves that, that'll um, put more people in patrol, but only for about three months because the, we do have three uh, student officers graduating next week. But this is one of the problems why I say you're never fully staffed. It takes over a year to hire somebody. And then <coughs> when they get out of the academy, they're going to have to do three months of field training um, and, and pass through that. So um, once we get through that, then we'll have at least those three, you know, back in, but at the same time, I have two more offices retiring 
in the springtime of, of, of this year. So that's just going to be a wash, yeah. probably. So, you know, the, so the, the lead time, you hire three, what, next week or this week, as you just they, alluded to? They get to. out next week. The yep. academy, are they going into the academy? No, they're graduating. Oh, so they're graduating. The yep. So then, so are they sworn officers at that point, or are they sworn officers after the three months of uh, what I'll this, call sworn they're, officers? They're, they're sworn officers, okay. but we'd like to give them at least three months of field training. Um, to, you know, Obviously. Let them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then there's two more that are leaving in a couple months. Yeah. And we have we do have two more entering the academy, but um, you know they won't be out for for twenty weeks, and but we're gonna, at the same time we're going to have additional people leaving. So it's um, you know. So okay, well I I, I guess we will. Uh, all right, well, and they're working overtime. Yes, I mean, we've we've uh, we've we've been working a lot of overtime. So they work. The, the I don't officers, say we, officers the work. Officers, officers work sixteen hour shifts. They do. Yeah. Double shifts, I guess. Yeah. We haven't had anybody do a full triple yet. Um, I know some places have, but we have uh, sixteen-hour shifts. Uh, they're working. So, and if I suppose if you work the what four to midnight, midnight to eight, or mm -hmm. and then you got to go to court. That's yeah. That's when courts like ten or nine o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah. So you, it's possible that you work twenty-four hours straight in mm -hmm. some capacity. Yeah. That can't sustain itself, can it? No, and Boston's actually going through the same thing right now. Boston uh, Commissioner Cox just sent a letter out to the um, to all the, the Mass Chiefs saying that uh, they're going to start taking lateral transfers, civil service laterals to, to Boston, um, which in the old days would have been, you know, would have sent alarms up because Boston pays significantly more. However, I think given... Um, Different things that have gone on. I don't know that the job is that appealing to people to go work in Boston. It's anymore. a different environment, like I would used think. To be, yeah, and so, uh, but he did let he did let the chiefs know that they're going to be taking laterals, and um, he's hoping that it doesn't cause too much disruption to uh, the departments in the area. Well. Uh Okay. Well, we'll keep a close watch on that. We got budget time coming yeah, up, so I hope that you get enough to. Staff the staff the town yeah. safely. Yep. Just as my own personal aside. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, okay. So they're dealing with the situation. You guys are out on the job. Um, so it is now the what did I say? Thirteenth of January. So it's coming up on the nineteenth. Two years from uh, the incident on Upland Road where Henry Tapia was. Uh, you know, died as a result. And I guess that's winding its way through the criminal justice system, too. It's been a couple of years, and trial would be coming up, at least by my look at an online docket, in the next few months, mm -hmm. unless it gets delayed again. But, but we'll see what, what happens with that. But, uh, you know, that sort of was on the heels of George Floyd and all of the uh, unrest and uh, protest and dismay uh, caused as a result of that, and of course the renewed call or a new call for police reform. So that's a broad term, police reform, but I guess it's brought here to the state, to the Commonwealth, uh, police reform in the last year or two. So um, since, what, what would you think is the biggest change, or what are some of the changes or the biggest changes as a result of the police reform uh, efforts? Well, well, first I'll say about um Henry Tapia, as you know, he we he was murdered, and we're charging. You know, he's being charged. Uh, the the the, sus the suspects being charged with murder. I can't speak much about it because well, that's uh, why I framed it yeah, sort of in that generic so, way. I, I, as you know, I, a lot I feel it's certainly no. Yeah. That's certainly not a a a hint of callousness yeah, on my no, part. I was yeah. trying to be proper in the fact yeah. that it's still going through so the throes. So it's, it's still uh, it's it's um it's still out there and as, as you know you, uh, you you were able to get some court documents you can see there's a lot of motions and a lot of things like that so we just want to be careful what we say around around that. Um but um that again that was much like the shooting that we spoke at at the time is these things can happen um anywhere you know um and I think it was a wake up call to to a lot of people in Belmont. Um we had the the reform movement, and at that time, um, you know, we talked. You know, I, I'm I'm always somebody that thinks that you know, um, if, you know, sometimes th there's opportunity to be had, and when we have tragedies and things like that, to make things better. And one of the um, 
one of the uh, the positives that came out of that for us is the co-responder social worker program. Co-responder program. Co-responder program. So you know, if you um, if you followed all the the, the t there was a lot of talk after George Floyd's murder about um, you know do we need police to do go to some of these calls? Do we need police you know to go to mental health calls? And police for a long time have been saying we're being asked to do things that we're not trained to do, you know, in terms of mental health and things like that. So uh, the state of Massachusetts came out with a, a grant program um, to fund a co-responder. And a co-responder, we, we call them a co-responder, they're a social worker. They're embedded in the police department. Uh, they drive inside a police vehicle with a, a police officer. And they, um, they, they go to the calls. Some calls they're not needed at, they, they stay in the vehicle. Other calls, uh, when they're mental health calls and things like that, they'll come out. Um, they're great for de-escalating um, because you know people see you have a civilian to talk to. It's not somebody. It's not a police officer, and um, they're able to do follow-ups. They're able to talk to healthcare providers, make people uh, in Belmont feel as though they're supported locally um, when they're in crisis. And we have uh, we have Emily Bartlett is our uh, is our co-responder. And there's some, we're very fortunate because there's some departments I know that were awarded this grant, but uh, when, have not been able to find a social worker uh, to work with them because not everybody, not all social workers want to, you know, work 11 to 7 and drive in police cars um, all afternoon and evening. So you have to find the right person, and then that person uh, goes through five weeks of training at another police department with another co-responder. And... Um, so we had our first um, operational meeting with Emily. Her first full month was in December. And she took two weeks vacation in December, but uh, she was able to do 13 what we call full evaluations. That was for people that um, were in crisis. And it, the program's actually called Jail Diversion and um, Emergency Room Diversion Program. Because when police go to a call where there's someone's uh, in, in mental health crisis and, and they're acting up, the police have three options. They can get the person to go voluntarily to the hospital, right, which then takes up a bed at the emergency room. Mm -hmm. The police can um, issue a Section 12, which would make the person go involuntary to the hospital, which, again, um, takes up a bed at the emergency room. Or if the person is doing, you know, damaging property or something like that, the police might have the opportunity to arrest the person. So the idea is with the co-responder is that you want to try to divert from all three of those things if you can, arrest, and emergency room diversions. So we had, um, she did 13 full um, evaluations of what she calls, and then we have non-traditional evaluations. And um, she did four non-traditional evaluations. That could be something like if the officer responds to a car accident and somebody's upset, she can talk to the person, help them, you know, see if they need anything. Um, if there's a sudden death and the, the police, when, when there's a sudden death in the home, the police have to stay in the house until um, you know the body's removed. She um, is a great asset to have to come in a situation like that if she needs to talk to the family and help them. And the, the big part is though is that she can provide follow-up. Um, you know, she can stay in touch with these people where if, if an officer went on his, his day four, which is his last day of work and dealt with somebody, and then the officer goes off duty for two days and you know, might not come out on the third day, you don't get that type of follow-up. You know, so having her, uh, having Emily on board is 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 big in the offices. Um, you know, I was concerned because I was like, you know, are they, they going to want to have a social worker in the cruiser with them? I mean, one of the reasons we, I became a police officer because I like to work independently sometimes. And um, but they've uh, they accept it and they like they really enjoy having uh, her in the in the vehicle and on the shift with them. So the the co-responder in this case, Ms. Ms. Bartlett, is 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 trained as a Social worker has mm -hmm. that type of training, yes. uh, that type of expertise, but also has some type of police training in addition, or is that is they just sort of I'm now just going to ride around? No, no police training. <clears throat> so, they, well, we we talk about it, and we do. We're actually going to go through scenarios where we want to keep her safe, right? So she only. Well, that crossed my mind, yes, yeah. because they, they don't have a weapon and they don't have. Well, I, I I didn't know. That's why I'm yeah. asking the question. She, yeah, no, it's a good question. She. Um, She's only well. She's never out of the sight of a police officer. Okay. And she, um, or out of the area of a police officer. And she, um, 
she would not come into, you know, if there was, did, I had a question last night at a meeting I attended, if there was like a domestic violence situation, mm -hmm. she would not come into the house until it was safe to do so. Because you don't know what's on the other yeah, side. you, you don't know. know and the, you don't the, want the, the late Richie Lane used to tell me, you don't know what's on the other side of the door. That's right. Unfortunately, that's yeah. all too true. So her safety is paramount, and she know, and, and that's what they, that's what she learns, is, you know, her, her job isn't to come running through the door when we have a call. She knows, um, you know, that her part of her training with her five weeks it was to you know to, to keep to help keep her safe and how is it that she arrives at the call so it means just by happenstance she's 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 in a police vehicle with an officer mm -hmm. patrolling the town and just a 911 call yeah. and that's basically it or yeah or does she get called in so she works during the day what about after seven o'clock well she I works would think, <laughs> when do the most of these things happen I, I don't know my, well, they, my they perception is it's usually sometimes at night part, <laughs> part of the um, part of the the in order to get the grant, we had to provide all our calls for service oh, okay. uh, pertaining to, to mental health calls. And so they came up with the time that 11 to 7 was the best time to have us there. Now, if I go to a, if an officer goes to a call at 9 o'clock at night, they pass that on. Even though she's not there, they'll pass that on to Emily, and she can follow up the next day and make contact with the person I if see. she has to. They also, they, their record management system is totally separate from ours, so she has a whole different... Um, you know, HIPAA protected record management system. So if she deals with somebody in Belmont, um, you know, she can look it up and she can say, oh, hey, this person uh, is, has dealt with the social worker in Waltham and, and call the social worker in Waltham. And they have a network that they can work together on um, to ensure that the person gets the, the right treatment that they need. Uh, okay, paid by the police department or paid separately? We, we get a grant through the Department of Mental Health and um, it's deposited in an account and quarterly we, we well, submit, an, I, I guess they I submit an invoice and we, we bill them. I'm, I'm not a criminal attorney by choice. I'm an attorney, but not I, I don't operate usually in that particular sphere. But things that people say to police officers as opposed to civilians evidentiary-wise, yeah. sometimes can make a difference. I'm wondering if there's much of a difference with res or what the effect would be if someone blurted out something to, to the co-responder that they otherwise couldn't have blurted out or have admissible to a police officer. Yeah, I don't think... Um, the, the, the types of incidents she's involved in are usually happening right in front of you. Okay. So if, um, you know, if, 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 you know, she was in a consultation with somebody and they were to reveal something to her, I think. I that would, would think be, that'd probably be, well, I don't, I don't know, you know what the parameters be, whatever, are. You know. Counselor, uh, yeah. patient privilege, maybe. I, I don't yeah. know, but, uh, but my, my, my legal mind is spinning here. I like yeah. the program, just trying to figure out it's how a that good all question. would work. We would never, I don't think we would ever intentionally put her in a situation where she could be, you know, be in, the, in a position to receive evidentiary, you know, um, information. Um, about, a, about a crime, you know, unless it was a, a fairly minor crime that had, had just happened. Um, because, you know, I, I guess it would be whatever, um, you know, health care provider um, privilege exists uh, between the two. Hmm. That's a good okay. question. Well, I, well, never, I, I, I don't know. I it's like, you know, someone yeah. says, hey, uh, you know, uh, I've had my issues, but uh, Joey over there, if you look underneath, uh, yeah. if you look over there, you'll find, you know, some bags of heroin. Well, the, or something of that. The You'll find another the, gun the, or something. The, I, I, the, I don't. the officer will be there. It won't ever be like she's in a in a private room with someone talking well, about these things. I, I don't know. So That's why I'm asking the if question. If they do, they, they they say it. But you, you find know. it to be very valuable. I think it's. I'm really excited about it. I think it's one of the best additions that that we've had um, to our department in a long time. And um, well. On that positive note, I think yeah. I'm looking at the clock here. We've been bantering away. I've ignored the clock. So Very before nice. I get yelled at by <laughs> our Cracker Jack staff in the back room, I want to say thank you. Thanks, All Chief. Right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for this chat. It always All goes right. pretty quick. Keep up the good work. And, uh, you know, be safe out there, as they say. Yeah. Best of luck to everybody. Right. And, well, there you go. Another chat with the police chief for uh, Joanne Zuvlis, the producer, and Matt and... The others in the back room, I'm Steve Rosales. Until next time, take care.